Hi, I'm Jack Dennis from Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Being a professional fly fisherman has given me a passport to fish all over the world. I get asked, where's your favorite fly fishing spot? That's an easy question. It's right here in my own backyard in Wyoming. I've been a fly fisherman for over 50 years. I've been in the business of teaching people to fly fish for over 40 years. What is fly fishing? To catch a fish on a fly rod, you must learn the art of fly casting, working the line into the air and directing it forward to a gentle landing on the water. Attached to the heavier fly line is a clear tapered nylon leader to which is tied a handcrafted artificial fly made from feathers and fur created to represent insects and minnows, fish food. What is the appeal of catching a fish on a fly? First, you must enter the fish's world and find where he lives, what he eats and how he feeds. In this concentration on nature, you become lost in the challenge and the beauty of fly fishing. A certain dialogue with nature is born. You are far from the trappings of civilization and the worries of earning a living. Your mind is clear, and no one has as much fun as a fly fisher. <laughs> yeah! And I'm here to introduce you to the world of fly fishing for the Cortland Line Company. fly fishing is a trout thing, but I'm here to tell you it's not. Probably the easiest fish to catch on a fly rod is bluegill or brim, any panfish. We're going to show you how to develop a cast. Cast like golf requires a swing. Here we call it a cast, and we're going to work with you on some foolproof ways of teaching yourself how to cast. Now. You're not gonna learn in one day. There's no way. You learn a lifetime how to get better at fly fishing. But it's one of the few sports that you can enjoy without having to be good at it. The search for gaining more knowledge in fly fishing can be the most fun. Trying to catch a fish that you've never been able to catch before, like a big fish. You know, when we think of a fly rod, we think of maybe freshwater fish, but it's not that. It's everywhere. You can catch fish like a sailfish, tarpon, bonefish, bluefish, stripers, salmon, you name it. The ocean is a great place to learn fly fishing and can be quite easy if you find the right conditions. But to start out, we're gonna tell you about the rod. The rod is probably one of the most important parts of your equipment. This rod here is made by Cortland. And we're gonna also talk about the reels, which is a line holder. I want you to think of one thing. I'm going to give you several tips here to remember. This rod is no more than an extension of your arm. One of the hardest things about learning this sport is to unlearn some of the habits you may have picked up being a spin fisherman. Now, if you've never fished before, you're going to learn this sport a lot easier than somebody who's spin fished before. And it all has to do with the cast. But before we get started with casting instruction, and we've got a lot to show you in the few minutes that we'll have together. And you're gonna meet a lot of my fishing friends and they're gonna help you in your quest to understand this wonderful and satisfying sport. First of all, the rod. They go from anywhere from $700 down to $50. Almost anybody can afford this sport. A rod is selected because it is a lever by length. We even make rods 15 feet long. We make rods as short as a seven foot rod. Now I want you to think, especially if you're gonna be teaching children, a seven foot rod doesn't mean you're a small person. Seven foot rod would be used in the small stream, say like the Smokies, to get around through the brush. But you're gonna want the leverage and at least start out with a minimum of eight feet. It's a graphite rod. When we're connecting this, we want to make sure that our guides line up. When we connect it, we're also going to be using what we call, this is a ferrule, okay? An oversleeve ferrule. Connect it just like that, cinch it down nice and tight. 
Now you see how my guides are all straight and all lined up. That makes your casting a lot easier. If it's turned even in the slightest bit, even halfway, just like that, it's not going to cast very well. It's going to be tough for you to cast. So we make sure those are nice and straight, nice and snug, just like that. Here's your weight of the rod. Here's the length of the rod. When I'm talking about weight of the rod, you can go anywhere from a 0 to a 15 weight. Watch how this bends. See that right there? See that right there? That's a six weight rod. That doesn't bend a whole lot. There's not a lot of give to that. Let's say I had a three weight rod. This thing would be bent all over. I could take that thing and I could pretzel it up. That's the difference in your weight rod. If you have a 15 weight rod, that baby's not going to hardly move at all. It's going to be real stiff. So that's the difference in your weight of the rod. The reason we use different weight rods is for different kinds of fish. If you're back home and you're fishing for little bass, little, little brim, little sunfish in a pond, you're probably going to use a lighter weight rod, more like a five, maybe a four, maybe even a six weight for some bigger bass. Let's say you jump on up and you go to saltwater and you're chasing big tarp and you're chasing, chasing bonefish, whatever you're going to do, you're going to need a little bit stiffer rod. Another reason that uh, there's a difference in the weight of the rod is, is wind. It's a lot easier to cast a heavier rod into wind, whether it's a six weight as opposed to a four weight. Get a little bit more, little more stiffness in that rod, it's easier to cast. That's why there's different weight rods. Now let's go on to the reel seat. Here's our reel seat right here. Back, I'm going to come here and I'm going to get my reel, and I'm going to show you how to connect this guy. On your reel seat, there's going to be two little inlets, okay? Here's one. Boom. Your reel goes right in there, okay? Hold that there, and right here, you got it up. It, it moves up and down. This is where you're going to pinch the bottom of your reel onto your reel seat. Boom. Right there. This knob right here, turn that all the way up, nice and tight, so your reel sits on there nice and tight. What you don't want to have happen is that if that's a little bit loose and you start casting and reeling, this gets loose also. You see how that's moving around now? That's what you don't want. That's why you want to make sure this is nice and tight. As you can see, this reel right now, my handle is on my left hand side. That's the way it comes. That's the way you're going to buy it. If you want to reel with your right hand, you're going to have to look at your instructions. Most guys cast to the right and they're going to reel with their left. That's why it's set up this way. I should tell you before we get going on this, that if you want this fly line to last you a little bit longer, you got to clean it. Very easy to clean. Some soapy water in a rag. And what you could do is you could strip all this line out, grab it like this, and when you're reeling, when you're cranking your line back on, you can hold that rag right here with your pincher finger, right there with your line, just like that. And you can reel that up, and that's going to clean your line as you're putting it on. That helps out too because it gets back on there nice and straight. You have a nice fresh start the next day when you're not Most fishing. guys cast to the right and they're going to reel with their left. That's why it's set up this way. Just a drag, just like that, and you pull. See how much harder that is to come out? Just like that. That's the adjustable drag. Use that for the type of fish you're fishing for, whether it's a small fish or a big fish. You can adjust it before you cast. You can also adjust it while you're fishing. If it's a little bit bigger fish you catch and it's running, you can quick to adjust that drag while you're fishing. Kind of a nice little feature on a reel. Um, the next thing we're going to talk about too is you can palm this reel. As the line's coming out, you can use your palm as kind of an, a, a drag also. Reels need not be expensive, but it's always a pleasure to have a reel that's very, very smooth and will work just kind of a luxury. Now that you understand the rods, we're going to talk about the fly line because that's the next most important part because this line has weight to it. Now in spin fishing, we use the lure to launch and pull the line out. In fly fishing, we have to cast the line and that pulls the fly along. And we've got other factors like wind, as you can see a little breeze coming up here on the South Fork. And the line helps us because we shoot the line. We cast the line by holding it up, then shooting it. Having a good, clean line is important. And I want to take you through the types of lines. Now, it's not going to be so important as you start in the beginning, but you should understand that some lines float and some lines sink. And it'll help you understand fly fishing a lot better. This here is a floating fly line. There's a lot of different kinds of lines out there. 
anywhere from a floating line to a sinking line to an intermediate sink line, all sorts of different types. This here, like I said, is floating. They also come in a weight forward and a double tapered line. Different types of deals there too. When I say weight forward, I'm talking about the front of your fly line is weighted, okay? It makes it so it shoots out, it casts a little bit easier. The back of your fly line, then it tapers off and it's not as heavy back there. That's the weight forward. A double taper is the same thing, only it's on both ends. This end's heavy, your front of your fly line's heavy, the middle of it's tapered off, it's a little bit thinner there, it's not as heavy, and the back end of your line is heavy. The reason we do that is people like, people like to take that and they, they like to switch that over so they can use both ends. It makes your line last a little bit longer. The reason we're going to use a weight forward line is because it casts a little bit better into the wind. The double tapered line doesn't shoot as well into the wind as a weight forward line. So that's why you're going to want to be using your weight forward line for that. The next thing we're going to talk about is the difference in a floating line, a sinking line, and an intermediate sink line. Like I said previously, the floating line is this. That's what we're using right now. Okay. Great for dry fly fishing, you can use it for streamer fishing, you can use it for nymph fishing, you can use it for a lot of different types of fishing. We also use an intermediate line, which is good for lake fishing. Cast well into the wind, it's going to land on the water, drop down just a little bit underneath the surface so the wind is not going to affect the line on top. The intermediate line also gives you more true action to your fly while you're fishing, which is essential for lakes. As a beginner, you may not think you need a sinking line, however, it's a good investment, especially the Cortland Fairplay that is very reasonable. Because if you're a warm water fisherman and going out to smallmouths or some of the panfish or even fishing some of the lakes, you're going to need a sinking line to get down to the fish. Especially if you have a float tube and you can get out in the water. You don't have to cast far with the sinking line and moving the fly in the water will be very similar to maybe spin fishing that you've done before. We've got to talk about some of the other fun equipment, and that is leaders. Leaders are a connection between uh, the line and the fly. You can see this line, if you put it on a fly, it will uh, be pretty visible. Leaders are very important. Leaders can be often the most overlooked part of fly fishing. And I think it's very important, because you can have a good cast, and if you don't have the right leader situation, you can actually end up spooking a fish or not having what we call a good presentation. What is a good presentation? One that lands as naturally as you can on the water and doesn't disturb the surface so a fish would be thinking you're an enemy of his. So what we've got to do is learn how to select a leader and what it's all about. Now as we learn the lines we call tapered. Leaders are also tapered so that they roll out. Let's take a look at leaders and what we call tippets, very important part of our fly fishing. We've talked about fly lines. A lot of people don't realize that a very important piece of equipment is the fly leader. This is the monofilament that we attach to the fly line and it becomes the connecting link between the line and the fly itself. And it's a very important thing. It needn't be complicated but it's something you really have to give consideration to. Let's now talk about leaders. Like your fly line, it's tapered. And it comes in two styles. It can either be a knotted leader built in sections or one complete drawn leader tapered thick to thin. Now let's take a look at leaders. First of all, you have your butt section and that's usually separate a 25 pound or 30 pound heavy nylon. It's your coordination from your fly line to where you tie on your leader. When you buy a tapered leader you need to know certain facts. Now let's take a look at it. First of all, the length. Most beginners use a seven and a half to nine foot leader. It's a little easier to handle. As you get more accomplished in flat water you may even want a 12 foot leader. This confuses a lot of people, 3x. That means the diameter of your tippet. And what your tippet is, is your end of your leader. Just right here, where you attach your fly. So this means the, means the diameter of the tippet is 3x. And they vary in poundage by the types of leaders. This particular leader happens to be 6.5 pounds at 3x. Now here, <laughs> pay attention here, when you go up, to 6x and 7x, that's a smaller diameter for use with smaller flies. 
when you drop down into, say, 4x to 3x, then you're getting a thicker diameter and a heavier liter and consequently a higher poundage. When you buy tippets, usually you have to get a good selection. And again, you still use the same criteria. It also attaches your leader directly to your fly line with a nail knot. We're going to learn about a nail knot later on in the program. Somewhere down the road, you're going to need a new leader. When you do want to reattach that leader, what I would do is I would cut off your old leader, leaving about 18 inches left on it. Take your new leader, cut off 18 inches of your new leader so we keep that same length of leader onto your fly line, and then reattach it with a blood knot. The blood knot we'll learn later on in the program also. I'm going to attach my leader on right now so we can get ready to go out and catch some of these fish. We're going to attach a tapered leader to our butt section. This leader here is going to be a 9 foot 6x leader. 9 foot means the length, the 6x is the tippet at the end of your leader, which is the diameter. Um, it starts thick and it goes down to thin, okay? The 6x being the tippet. The tippet is probably, oh, anywhere from 10 to 12 inches long. Once you use that up, let's say you use all 10 inches up, you're going to have to use something else to make it thin again and to make it as long. That's where the tippet comes into play. Right here I have spools of tippet on my shirt. 3x, 6x, 5x, whatever I need I'm going to have right here. So then I can reattach the tippet to my tapered leader and make it nice and long and the diameter is going to be what I want from the start again. Now let's talk about stringing the line up into your, into your rod so you can get ready and go out there and start fishing. Right here where it starts with my leader. And a very important thing to remember here is doubling it over. I always double over my fly line like this so I'm getting ready to put it up into my guides. Okay. So we're going up in here. There. What's the one thing that always happens as you're stringing up your fly line? Okay? You're doing this, you're getting ready to fish, you're all excited, you see a big fish rising over there on the bank. Boy, I'm in a hurry to get out of there. I'm getting up in here and I, I drop it. This is what's going to happen right here. If it's doubled over, it's going to catch on your guides. If you're just trying to single, single line that thing up your guides and you drop it, it's going to go whoop, all the way down and it's going to take you another five minutes to get out there and fish. So now it catches right there. I finish up, I put it right up my guides. All the way up. Helps to have good eyesight here too. All the way up, pull your leader through and your fly line down. Just like that and you're all ready to go. Now you're all strung up. Those fish are still rising over there and let's go get ourselves a fish. valuable tool. It's called a tie fast. It'll do a lot of things for you, but probably the most important thing is either putting backing onto your fly line or leader butt with a nail knot. And right now I'm going to introduce Steve, and Steve's going to show you how to tie this tie fast onto a fly line, uh, both backing and a leader. I'd like to introduce you to a friend of mine, Steve Berry from Phoenix, Arizona. On my trips down to Phoenix every year, I love to go fishing, and I met Steve a number of years back and was really taken back by your fly fishing knowledge. But also he's a pilot, he's a helicopter pilot. And uh, now I find out you're not flying as much and you're the PR officer for the police department, right? That's correct, for the Mesa Police Department here in Arizona. So you're not gonna make any mistakes on this tape? Right? I'm gonna try not to, I'm gonna uh, try and get it right. never been fly fishing, I bought my first outfit on my way to my first fly fishing trip. And uh, it, you know, it's been all downhill from there. I, should, <laughs> I should don't think so. I should probably be in some sort of 12-step program for fly fishing. <laughs> <laughs> You'd like to see more black fly fish, wouldn't you? Oh, absolutely. It's a great hobby. It's a great sport. I think just the fact that a lot of people haven't been exposed to it, uh, much like myself, you yeah. know, had I not had that friend that day that introduced yeah. me to it, I might not be fly fishing you know, today. I have, I have several friends out in California, actually presidents of their club, that got in it the same way you did. Well, you know? I, ironically, I am the president of the Desert Flycasters. Oh, my which gosh! Is, <laughs> which is one of the uh, two largest fly fishing clubs here in the state of Arizona. We've got approximately 200 member club and uh, man, that's a great way to get started in something like that. Okay Jack, now what I'm going to do is go ahead and show you how to use the, the uh, 
High pass, the fits really nice, uh, just into the cross, the crease of your fingers. It's got a great spot on the top for your thumb. That's going to be very important. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take uh, my backing, lay it through uh, with my tag end hanging out the front. And I'm going to hold that, then I'm going to take and start wrapping back up the high pass tool towards my thumb, keeping those wraps nice and tight next to each other. Uh, I'm going to make about six wraps going back up, and then I'm going to use my index finger along the side of the tool just to hold that in place. I'm going to take my tag in and push it back down through the hole and pull it out snug while still holding everything else together. Um, I've got my thumb holding down the, the back end. I've got my forefinger holding down the front. My tag in's out the front. You can see all the wraps are nice and tight. Then I take my fly line that I'm going to attach it to, and I'll take the end of the fly line. This is the end that's going to be on the reel next to, uh, next to your back. And I'm going to push it back up through the hole. And I'm going to stop. I'm going to slide that line off onto the fly line. Um, a nail knot is basically like the, uh, a finger knot, if you remember that. Um, and at this point, you can see that the tie fast tool actually will come loose. So exactly the same way that we did this will be the way. And it is going to end up uh, looking like this, as you can see the monofilament and the, uh, the leader knot. And this is done by a tool. Now, if you do it by hand, you're not going to have nearly uh, as much success. Now, most fly shops will do this for you, uh, but you may not be near a fly shop, so you should learn how to do it. Now, Steve's going to come in here and show you another knot, then his partner in crime, Cinda, is going to come in and show you some really cool knots to attach your fly to the tippet or leader. my tippet to my leader. Uh, found it to be a very strong knot, very easy to tie, especially when it's cold out and uh, we're in those fishing situations that aren't always ideal. Okay, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to act as though the, the orange piece of fly line um, is my leader and the yellow piece of fly line is going to act as my tippet shield. Uh, the first thing you want to do is uh, save yourself a lot of headache and give yourself enough room to actually tie the knot. Um, I've been out on trips or, or been uh, teaching classes and folks will try and use such a small amount of material that they won't have any room to actually tie the knot. And all you do is make yourself crazy. Um, spare yourself the extra penny, give yourself a little bit of room and do it right the first time. So again, the orange is going to be uh, my leader, the yellow is my tippet. Now I've laid the two pieces of fly line across each other in opposing directions. And at that point, all I want to do is make an overhand knot while holding it all together with my thumb and being sure that the legs of the line all remain equal. You can see I've pulled that all the way through, and that would be my tip. Oftentimes at this point, one of the first questions my students will ask is, well, how do I know which end to pull all the way through? In the real world, that's usually pretty easy to pick up because usually there's a nine-foot fly rod and a reel and everything else attached to the other end. You'll know very quickly which end you're going to need to pull through. Um, I've already made that first overhand loop. Now I want to go ahead again while keeping everything equal, make that same loop and come through a second time while holding on everything and being sure that... For nearly a hundred years, Cortland has broken new ground in sport fishing line development. From the introduction of floating lines in 1953 to the legendary 444 series, Cortland has pushed the boundaries. And now, Cortland has developed a line that repels dirt, sheds water easily, floats like a cork, and has unmatched durability. Introducing the 555 series, the right tool for the challenge that is fly fishing in the 21st century. Cortland has the right fly line for you. Cortland produces high quality fly lines so that you get the maximum performance and enjoyment out of every cast and every fish. Try Cortland's new 444 Clear Camo or the stiff long distance 444 SL Clear and Clear Tip Fly Lines. These superior intermediate lines are perfect for stealthy fishing in still or fast moving water. See a Cortland Pro Shop for our complete line of quality fly fishing products.
What is fly fishing? To catch a fish on a fly rod, you must learn the art of fly casting, working the line into the air and directing it forward to a gentle landing on the water. Attached to the heavier fly line is a clear tapered nylon leader to which is tied a handcrafted artificial fly made from feathers and fur created to represent insects and minnows, fish food. What is the appeal of catching a fish on a fly? First, you must enter the fish's world and find where he lives, what he eats and how he feeds. In this concentration on nature, you become lost in the challenge and the beauty of fly fishing. A certain dialogue with nature is born. You are far from the trappings of civilization and the worries of earning a living. Your mind is clear and no one has as much fun as a fly fisher. Surfer! All right. Woo-hoo! Yes. That was great. You've just seen the best part of fly fishing, casting over a rising fish, having him take your fly, and then landing him. But that's not the place where you learn how to cast a fly. You need a place like your own backyard, a little bit of lawn, or if you're lucky, maybe a pond. That's where you learn how to cast a fly. We're going to meet a friend of mine, Dan Abrams, who helps me with my fly fishing schools and seminars and talk about the basics of casting. Well, Dan, when a beginner first asks you about learning to fly fish, you always give them a little bit of advice. What's that advice? To have fun. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. The whole idea of fly fishing is to have fun. Absolutely. Too many people get hung up on all the in intricacies of fly fishing. Sometimes they take it so seriously they don't have any fun. And one of the things that I try to teach people is to have fun. You can go into this on any level. If you want to learn Latin and catch all the flies by their Latin name, if you want to learn 52 different kinds of casts, that's fine. You can have fun at that. That's right. But you can have fun at the very basics. And this is what I'd like to talk about today, just basic fun, basic fly fishing. Well, before we do the basic cast, we've got to talk about the basic equipment. One of the basic things you need is a basic fly rod. That's right. Now let's talk about fly rod. First of all, let's go over its parts. This is the cork grip here, your handle. This is a cigar shape. Your reel seat. And there's a lot of different types of reel seats. Very important part of the rod is the butt section. This butt section is going to help determine the action that we have in the rod. When I say action, I mean this. Whether it's limber, whether it's stiff, or whether it's a medium action. And a lot of people ask, hey, what should I have as a beginner? 
If you want an all-around rod, you want a medium action, one that'll handle small dry flies and on, on up into some of the larger streamers. Your heavy action you're going to find on steelhead and ocean type rods. And your real light action, well, they're for dry flies. As you look up your rod, you have your ferrule. A lot of the rods are two section and you may find that a four section rod uh, may be great for backpacking or traveling. But most of our rods today are made out of graphite. And you can spend a lot of money, up to $300, or you can spend down in the neighborhood of only $75 or $80 and still get a great fishing instrument. Let's take a look at what you should look for when you buy a rod. The first few numbers are usually the manufacturer's code, and this is an important one right here. Nine foot in length. A lot of beginners ask me, what kind of rod should I start out with? Well, I recommend either a nine foot or eight and a half foot rod. This will be a lot easier for you to cast and be a much more effective fishing instrument. Notice here, the total weight of the rod, three and a half ounces. Now this is really important, the rating system. It says A, F, T, M, A, line size, six. And rods start approximately at two weights and go all the way up to 14 weight. A six weight is a good all around rod. A five weight, again a good all around rod. Four weight, you're getting down into your lighter line sizes, more spring creek type fishing. Seven, eight weights, more into your heavier bass fishing or steelhead fishing. But the main thing is to get a good rod because that's probably the most important part of your equipment. Now that we've talked about fly rods, Dan, uh, what else do we need? One of the things we need is a reel, and of course the kind of reel that we would recommend is what we call a single action fly reel. And let's talk about single action fly reel. All they are are line holders. They've got to be simple. This is a single action reel. Let's take a look at it. On this reel, it has a palming rim. Then the spool comes out. Simple. Has adjustable drag here. Now starting out, you don't have to have anything fancy. This reel sells for about $30. Here's a reel that sells for about $20. Again, simple click to hold the line, and this rim acts as the drag as it goes out when a fish is pulling on it. Very simple. As you get more complicated, you can add more sophisticated drag systems for bigger fish and different types of species. This is a saltwater reel quite complicated and designed to hold larger fish. Drag is the key to its expense. It's over $200. Reels need not be expensive, but it's always a pleasure to have a reel that's very, very smooth and will work. Just kind of a luxury. As you can tell, you don't have to spend a lot of money on a fly reel. But something you really need to spend some money on is a good fly line, right Dan? Don't skimp there. A lot of people think, well, I'll just buy a cheap fly line, see whether I like this sport. And they mess themselves up and they won't like the sport because they have difficulty casting. A good fly line is a must. Now let's discuss fly lines. There's several types. First of all, there's a floating line to float on the surface then a sinking line that gets down deep, and a combination floating and sinking line. First of all, let's take a look at a line when you look to buy one. I'm going to see this numbering system, WF7F. You might see DT7F. What does this mean? Well, it means that first of all, it's a floating line, and the WF means weight forward. The weight forward lines are thin, then thick a little ways down the line, and then thin again. Or your double tapered start out, the first 10 or so feet are thin, then it gets thick in the middle of the line, then tapers back down. Just like the name, double tapered. Weight forward, the weight is forward. The new weight forward lines are designed, the first part of the tip so that it lands softly. So you can use it for dry fly fishing. Now, you might say to yourself, what should I buy? A double tapered or a weight forward line? Determine the type of fishing you're going to do. You're going to fish a lot of dry flies with short casts, then you want a double taper. You want to make longer cast into the wind especially, you'll like a weight forward. 
Remember the seven. That seven coordinates to your rod. You remember when we talked about rod size two through 14? Well, this is what matches the rod. If the rod says a six on it, you'll match it with a six line. Obviously, the twos, as we talked about in the rods, are the lighter lines, and the sevens and eights are the heavier lines. This is a sinking tip fly line, the first 10 feet sink, and the rest of it's floating line. It's excellent for quick pickup on streams. This is a full sinker, really great for lakes, and there's different speeds of sinking lines. Then we have our regular floating lines, and this is a standard grade, really good to start out with. And if you want a harder finish, then there are premium grades that uh, are designed for longer cast and higher speeds. But whatever line you think you might need, Go to a fly shop and ask them, and they'll help you select the proper line. Jack, we've talked about fly lines. A lot of people don't realize that a very important piece of equipment is the fly leader. This is the monofilament that we attach to the fly line, and it becomes the connecting link between the line and the fly itself. And it's a very important thing. It needn't be complicated, but it's something you really have to give consideration to. Let's now talk about leaders. Like your fly line, it's tapered, and it comes in two styles. It can either be a knotted leader built in sections, or one complete drawn leader tapered thick to thin. Now let's take a look at leaders. First of all, you have your butt section, and that's usually separate. A 25-pound or 30-pound heavy nylon. It's your coordination from your fly line to where you tie on your leader. When you buy a tapered leader, you need to know certain facts. Now let's take a look at it. First of all, the length. Most beginners use a seven and a half to nine foot leader. It's a little easier to handle. As you get more accomplished in flat water, you may even want a 12 foot leader. This confuses a lot of people, 3X. That means the diameter of your tippet. And what your tippet is, is your end of your leader. Just right here, where you attach your fly. So this means the diameter of the tippet is 3x, and they vary in poundage by the types of leaders. This particular leader happens to be 6.5 pounds at 3x. Now here, <laughs> pay attention here, when you go up to 6x and 7x, that's a smaller diameter for use with smaller flies. When you drop down into, say, 4x to 3x, then you're getting a thicker diameter and a heavier leader and consequently a higher poundage. When you buy tippets, usually you have to get a good selection. And again, you still use the same criteria. This has 30 meters, four pound, five X, and it comes on a spool. A lot of times you can buy pre-wrapped spools in a leader dispenser. Now this has from 12 pound, uh, one X down to 2.8 pound 6x, all in one convenient little package. Also, you can buy liter dispensers where you can add these to the dispenser. yourself, why do you need tippet material? Well, you're going to break off your tippet and tie new flies on, and you use it up. Rather than tie on a new leader, you can add just a tippet section in and go right on fishing. We've talked about the basic rod and reel. Now let's talk about some other accessories, such as a vest here. Vest is very important to carry our equipment around with us. We need fly boxes to carry our flies in. Uh, they need not be expensive. There are a lot of different styles of fly boxes, but they are basic equipment. We need something to clip off the ends of the tippet material when we tie a new fly on, when we tie a new piece of tippet material on, the tag ends. Some people will use a fingernail clipper that they can buy very inexpensively. They work great. Here's something, they charge you a little more money for it, but it makes a nice job. Let's take a look at the equipment that's in Dan's vest. Hanging on the back is a net, and it's really easier on the fish if you use a net. Let's take a look at the other items. You got some fly dryer to uh, dry out the fly when we have slime on it, and various types of fly floating from uh, uh, semi-liquid to a paste uh, to a silicone for smaller flies. Also a uh, selection of small mini shot for nymph fishing. 
strike indicators. We'll learn more about those when we get into nymph fishing. And of course, lots of boxes of flies. And we'll talk more about flies a little later on in the tape. Uh, some scissors, either on a Swiss Army knife or separate. A hook sharpener to sharpen our hooks. Uh, there's a little tying tool. We'll show you how to tie a nail knot with this. Another important instrument is a pair of forceps to remove the hook out of the jaw of the fish. It's easier on the fish. You'll have a lot of other accessories you may not need. Uh, an extra spool to carry various types of lines in your vest. But the important thing is to have the necessities so you can enjoy the sport of fly fishing. And now it's the time to learn the basic cast. I notice you're putting on your sunglasses. Why sunglasses? That is part of the basic cast. Sunglasses do three things and everybody should wear them all the time, even on a cloudy day. First of all, even on a cloudy day, there can be some glare that the sunglasses help eliminate. Secondly, that will help protect you from an errant fly as it comes zipping by you. Uh, thirdly, Sunglasses will also, if they're polarized sunglasses, will help you to see fish in the water, and that's what we're going to be after. And that's what we're looking at, the fish. And before we can catch the fish, we've got to learn the basic cast. A lot of you maybe have spin fish before. Maybe you've never cast before, whether it be a spinning lure or a fly. And there's some things you need to learn. And some things you need to unlearn. Ah, <laughs> one of the things that people tend to do, they bring over the basic spin cast technique to their fly fishing and gets them into a lot of trouble. <laughs> One of the things, a spinning lure is designed to take the line off the reel, out through the guides at the end of the rod and out toward your target. And the heavier the lure, sometimes it makes it much easier to cast for a great distance. In fly fishing, it is the line that carries the fly out. And actually, it's much easier to cast without a fly on. The larger the fly, the more wind resistant the fly, the heavier the fly, the more difficult it is. We have to get that in our head, get that squared away in our thinking before we can make a successful flight. One thing I want you to remember when starting your basic cast is that your fly rod here is just an extension of your arm. If you had a 10-foot arm, you wouldn't need a fly rod, although you may have a little trouble attaching the reel to your arm. The wrist, which you use in your spin fishing, is not a part of the fly cast. Remember that. That's right, Jack. And one of the other things that that brings us to right now is this whole matter of timing. We have to have the right kind of a timing so that we can focus that fly line going out to our target. As you see the fly line going through the air, you can see a loop being formed. The timing forms this loop. The wider the loop, the poorer the timing, and the more drag in the air. What will happen is this. See how the line piles up. As you can see, your objective is to get a tight loop so your line will go out farther in the air. How do we accomplish this? Watch this. The basic cast is going to start out with a basic grip. One of the ways that I teach my students to do this is just as if you're going to be shaking hands with someone. You're going to be shaking hands with your fly, fly rod. Hope it becomes a friend of yours, so meet it. Thumb on the top. Just grip it firmly around that cork handle. As you can see, this thumb on the top of the cork is going to be your loop former. We're going to be talking about that in just a few moments. A comfortable stance is very important. And this is something that you're just going to have to work out for yourself. But I like to face the target with one foot slightly ahead of the other. I'm right-handed. I like my left foot just slightly ahead of my right. I find this much more comfortable for me as I get into the casting position. Now it's time to set up the basic cast. 
we're going to put Dan in the middle of a clock and make his rod and his arm part of the hand of a clock. Right now it's 9 o'clock. Everybody understand that? 9 o'clock. Now he's going to raise his rod to 10, and then up to 12 o'clock, and now he's going to go back further, a place you do not want to be in fly casting. Anywhere past 1 o'clock, you're in big trouble. Now let's go back to 9 o'clock. That's where we're going to start our cast. We're at 9 o'clock now. Notice that Dan's hand is gripping the line. He's holding on to the line. When Dan picks up his line, he's bringing it up with some power. Now, a loop is being formed. Notice the loop. If your wrist breaks at this point, it widens the loop. You must correct this before you can go on to your cast. You have to keep from breaking that wrist. Before we even go on with the next part of the cast, we've got to learn to not separate the rod from the arm. There is an easy way of correcting this problem, and it's the use of a wrist lock. This will keep you from breaking your wrist and add a little more power to your cast and tighten your loop. It attaches on the butt end of the rod, right around the wrist, like this, and is adjustable. Okay, now we're going to start again at uh, 9 o'clock and reconstruct this whole cast. As he raises his rod to add power, we're going to go back and stop at 1 o'clock. And that's where we're going to end up at. We hope you don't end up farther back than that. But in our mind, we're going to be thinking 12 o'clock. Stop at 12. And you'll drift back a lot farther. But if you can say in your mind and place yourself in that clock, 12 o'clock, and stop. One of the biggest problems in fly casting that I have experienced teaching beginners is they don't know when to stop. Now let's watch Dan make a complete cast. Now we have to talk about timing, right Dan? How long do you pause when you make that complete stop? You have to wait until the line on rolls behind you before starting your forward cast. This is one of the biggest mistakes of beginners is starting the forward cast too quickly. They'll rush it this way, and they think they have to get that line going out in front of them as quickly as possible, but you have to wait it out. A friend of mine who you're going to see on this tape, Mike Lawson, has an excellent theory. You know, he's from Idaho, <laughs> and he talks about a potato on a stick. To illustrate this point, let me give you a little tip. In fact, I'm going to take the tip off the rod. If that potato was on the tip of this rod, and we gave it a flip like that, it wouldn't go very far. So we make a complete stop and build up some power, and then give it that little flip. That potato will go out there. And also, think about your tip and a fly line. This is a great way to sit by the TV in your living room and practice your cast, practice your timing. You, the more line you get out, the more feel you'll get for the timing necessary. You can even practice on the side, and you can watch your loop. You can look at your loop and see how tight it is. And if you start breaking your wrist, the loop will start opening up. As we're putting our basic cast together, as Jack has rightly pointed out, that the power stroke is very important. And the power stroke is what forms the loop. If you have a wide power stroke, you're going to get a wide loop. If you get a narrow power stroke, you're going to get a nice, tight loop. It usually is formed right as it comes past your ear. It's something It's very short, very quick. That's all it is, right there. And your thumb comes back into play again. It is the thing that starts your power stroke, and your thumb is that which forms the loop.
while we've been talking about the right hand, the grip, and how it forms the loop, everything else, and a lot of people forget the left hand is very important in forming a good cast. What it does, it controls the line. A lot of people forget this, and on their back cast, they break. Or it could be a big lake. But the theories remain the same. When fishing the still waters, you want to look for a lot of moss and undergrowth. And watch, use your eyes, your polarized glasses, to spot fish cruising. If they're cruising and moving, they're probably feeding. Notice that I'm varying my retrieve. Like another cast. I'll use different fast strokes like this, and then slow strokes to try to see which type of retrieve may work. All right. All right. Let's talk about fly fishing in the lake for trout. It's going to be a little bit different than fishing in the stream. There's a few things that you must have when you're fly fishing in the lake. The most important part of fly fishing in the lake is the depth you're fishing at. Whatever you're going to be using, whatever the trout's eating, is not moving near as much as it is in a stream. Therefore, the trout's going to have a lot of time to look at it. In order to get it in front of the trout all the time, all day long, you're going to have to use what we call intermediate lines, sinking lines. That is a must when you're out fishing for trout in the lake. Because in order to get that at the right depth, you have to have the right sinking line, whether it's you know, medium or whether it's way down low. You've got to get whatever you're fly fishing with down to the trout so they can eat it. They can look at it all day long if they want to. They can follow that all the way up to the boat. So we have to really, really hone our skills on, on how to retrieve, on how to retrieve our flies through this water. It's got to it's gotta look very, very natural. A tougher way to get fish on a lake is with a dry fly. I'm not saying you can't do it, but it is a little bit tougher. You got to wait for a hatch. You got to be there at the specific times. You got to really key that stuff in. A nice thing to have is a belly boat or a pontoon boat. That's very important when you're fishing lakes is to find the structure. Might be harder to get at from the shore, so go out and get yourself a boat. It'd be a lot easier to get to. Get a book. Denny Rickards offers a great, great book and videos on fly fishing still waters. You know, one of the reasons I fish lakes is it offers us an opportunity to catch a lot of big fish, probably a lot more than what you're going to do on a stream and a river. And the other thing that I really like about fishing lakes is it gives you a lot of solitude. But, you know, we struggle a lot of times because lakes seem to be intimidating for a lot of us. But, folks, it doesn't have to be. Fishing lakes is really a matter of three things. Presentation, which really includes your ability to cast, get the fly to the fish, the fly line that you choose to fish with, which controls the depths and the angles, and the retrieve. So if you can concentrate on those points, along with the patterns that you use, make sure that they're suggestive, they imitate more than one food source, and look at the conditions that you face when you're out on the water, because those conditions will change and vary. So uh, these are the reasons that I'm successful on lakes. You know, folks, one of the things that I find that's really critical, and I try to share this with all the clients when I'm guiding, is that when you get out to the lake, well, before you even get started, there's five key things that you have to look at because these five keys are going to give these trout direction as to where they're going to be, what depth they'll be at, what they're going to feed, how fast they'll digest their food, when they spawn, and here's the five that I look at. First thing I'm going to look at is the sky. Is it sunny or cloudy? Because that'll make a lot of difference on what fly we're going to use, what depth we're going to fish. Second point that's critical to me is the water. Is it flat like you see here right now, or is it rippled? Third thing, is the water warm or is it cold? Because if the water's cold, that means we're going to have to slow down our retrieves. If it's warmer, we can do a lot of other things that are different. We can speed up our retrieve. Fourth thing, I look at the water and determine whether it's clear or it's cloudy, because if it's cloudy, we can do some things that we can't do when the water's clear. That's a tougher presentation thing. And the fifth thing, one that you have to know, you've got to know the depth of the water you're fishing, folks. If you don't have some way of measuring it with a depth finder or something, then you can probe and count down on your line until you start hitting that bottom. But these are the key things, and all these things will direct and tell these fish where they're going to be, what they're going to eat, how soon they're going to digest is 
points I just made a minute ago. And from those points, all that tells us, it'll tell us what line to use, what retrieve to use, what flies, what speed to pull them. And it's really kind of a, a key to what you need to do in order to be successful. stay here in this weed part here it leaves no vibrations to cover over the fish so it allows the fish to cruise up along the edge of the lake here it, it gives you a chance to have a, a fly smack bang in front of the fish straight in front of you Dennis that bit of weed straight 12 o'clock in front of you no 12 o'clock Twice the distance of the this guard. Put it here, you see a patch of weed? Yep. Just on the right hand side of the weed, watch, and you see the fin of the fish. Either his tail or his dorsal fin is going to pop up. Just on the side of the weed. You know, we've talked about learning to cast, and we've shown you on the lawn and in a pond. Now we're on a river. Things change. We have currents. We have fly drag. See the fly drag on the water. What's the object out here? Well, the object is to make that insect look natural. We accomplish this by casting, by laying down a cast. 
The way I just cast is a natural cast. The fly lit on the water and floated like a natural. Hey, if you're laying your line out like that, that's not a natural cast, and the fish know it. And if you make a bad cast, you don't rip it out of the water like that either. You know, a lot of big, big fish have been caught on bad cast. You make a cast and it comes up short like this, let it float out. Let it drift on by. You'll be really surprised. You may be turning to look at your buddy, and a big fish will come up and take it. You just never know. But probably the most important thing a beginner can learn is not to cast a lot of line. Don't get out a lot of line and start getting out of control. That's why I'm standing in the water. We want to sneak up on the fish and get a proper cast. Many times, you're going to find you're going to have to cast upstream. Conditions will warrant it, and that's the old classic English way of fly fishing, casting to an upstream rising fish. We're fishing it dry, we're laying it out soft. If we do not strip line in and the fly floats straight towards you and he strikes, oh boy, here's what's going to happen. Line's going to go all over you and you're going to look like a Christmas tree. How do you compensate for that? Well, you make a nice soft cast and then you strip the line in at the same rate as it's coming back towards you, watching your fly. Let's try it again. Working on a little line, sending it down softly, and now when the fish strikes, you have a nice even pull on your rod, and you're going to connect up with the trout, and that's what it's all about. Now, lots of times the current will be coming very fast, or it might be at a slight angle, and you'll find that when you make a cast, that you want to add a little slack. I just wiggled my rod tip. And still, you're going to have to compensate using your stripping in method. Another way of accelerating your line is a simple roll cast. And that accelerates your line rather than have to strip it all the way in, then pick it up in the air and start casting. It's very popular with people that are working banks that need to move real quickly. And they say, oh, see a fish over their eyes? Roll and cast. Try it again. You look, see a fish, a little flick of the rest, and you're back in business. Well, there's two ways that you can accomplish a natural drift. You can lay your line upstream and follow it down with your rod. See how I'm doing that? Or when you lay your line out, then just roll your rod over, adding a little loop. Again, follow your line down, pick up a little bit of slack, and you get a longer float. And again, let that fly float out. Even though it's dragging, gently fish it back. Now I'm going to pick the line up with a little flick of my wrist, just like that. Let me show it to that to you again. It's just like adding a little roll cast to it. Just like that, and we're accelerating the line. The reach mend, let me show you that again. Reach mend, reach up, direct your line over. All you're doing is taking your arm in the middle of the cast and reaching over. Avoid, you always want to avoid hitting the water like this. The minimum of false cast. When we talk about the false cast, all the false cast is either doing is drying out your dry fly or helping you work out line. And it's easy to add your men's. You can add it as you go downstream. Now watch, we want this fly to float even longer. We can just feed out line, just like this. Feeding out line, increasing the length of our float. One of the biggest mistakes I used to see beginners make when I guided was reaching for a line. Let me show you what I mean. 
You make a cast and the line gets away from you. All of a sudden, you reach up here to grab your line. And I'll guarantee you, a trout's waiting. The minute you reach up to grab your line, whoa, he grabs that fly. How do you eliminate that? Well, learn to cast this way. When you lay your fly out, immediately your line goes to your hand. It doesn't go up here, and you don't start stripping like this. Because when you start stripping like that, that trout's waiting for you. Here, we're going to put it all together. Here we go. Lay it down. The hand goes right to the finger, right here the finger, right there. And you start stripping accordingly. And hit it. Oh, look at that, guys. OK, notice where my hand, right here, stripping the line. I brought my line to my hand, so I was ready for the strike. A lot of people lose fish, have to really trouble landing a fish on a fly rod, mainly because you've got a lot of slack out here. You might find the easier way of doing it is to reel in your line. But what happens, sometimes the fish will decide to run towards you like this fish, and you'll have to strip in to keep tension. The key to fly fishing is keeping your rod high and tension. Now, lots of times a fish might run and go away from you, and he'll pull the line out just like this. Whoop, there he goes. Oh, it's perfect. Now we have him on the reel. Bigger fish, you need to play on your reel. Hear the drag? That drag will help tire the fish. Now we'll reel in some slack. Very important to keep your rod high, especially when you're wading in deep water. Up oh, there he goes. Now notice, the rod is taking the shock of playing the fish. The whole rod. I usually tend to put my rod in the middle of my chest. And we just play this fish. Whoops, hey, we got a live one on here. You might find other times you may want to adjust your drag down to a looser drag. It's good to have a reel that you can adjust the drag. Always try to keep the fish downstream from you. If he gets upstream, he can go straight up there and you can't follow him. It's easier to go downstream with the trout. Well, we are going to move a little closer here to shore. We've got some big rocks out here. You always got to be aware. Whoa, nice fish. You always got to be aware of what structure you have around. So you don't bring the fish right into a log. The key of fly fishing is being aware of your surroundings. Looks like we've got a nice cutthroat. You know, wading is a very important part of our fly fishing, but it also can be very dangerous. First of all, you should have a good wading belt. And I really prefer the neoprene waders. I feel a lot more safe in them. But one thing you always want to remember, go with the current. Anytime you turn and start trying to fight it like this, you're asking for trouble. You always want to wade looking downstream, seeing what might happen, what you might step on, and never, ever cross your feet and lose your balance. It should be one step at a time, planting that downstream boot and working your way over, usually pick a 45 degree angle and wade towards the bank. Never try to fight the stream. A good nice. pair of waders, knowing your limitations and where you can wade, and you'll always have a wonderful fly fishing experience and not go swimming. Wading is serious business, and you should have the proper wader to fit your style of fishing. This is a hip boot. Goes just right up to the hip with the felt sole. For the fly fisherman, you really need that felt to keep from slipping on the rocks. This particular boot is in one piece. You can get it in chest highs. But remember, as I showed you in the wading sequence, be sure to wear your wading belt when wearing chest highs. Some of you may want to use a stocking foot wader, which you'll need, of course, a wading shoe with a felt sole. There's different types of shoes made. It gives you a great deal of variety 
You can use lightweight hip boots like this or a chest high that's lightweight like this. Great flexibility and only have one shoe. Probably the most popular wader today is your neoprene, which provides a great deal of protection and, of course, warmth in the winter and with the cooling action when it's wet, it'll provide coolness in the summer too. A great way of wading with a neoprene wader. But the most important thing about wading is to wade safe. Wear a wading belt. Gary LaFontaine is recognized as one of the top authorities on nymphs. His books, Challenge of the Trout and Caddisflies, are bestsellers. The new River Rap audio tapes have excited the angler. Join Gary as he teaches us the basics of nymph fishing. Thanks, Jack. Nymphs. They imitate the subsurface life of aquatic insects. Whether it's mayflies, stoneflies, caddisflies, they're really important to the trout. Most of the trout's diet consists of nymphs. A good selection of them and a little bit of skill towards using them will make you a better fly fisherman. They'll help you. Come on along with me and let me show you how to use them. Some water, it just aches to be fished with a nymph pattern. A riffle like this will contain most of the subaquatic insects in a trout stream. The riffles, rather than the slower pools, produce about 80 to 90 percent of the food in, in, in a waterway. Now if you go up there and you work this nymph along and you bring it back dead drift, you're going to be covering a lot of fish that are used to seeing those subaquatic insects drift by their nose. Now what I like to do is fish a nymph dead drift. Now when you do that upstream, you have to have slack. You have the same problems of drag that you have with a dry fly. Instead of the actual fly itself, what you're watching is either the line tip or a strike indicator. You cast out and you raise the rod. You keep in touch, but you don't pull on it. You don't pull on that tip. You don't jerk that fly through the water unnaturally. You let it drift. You let it waff, waffle its way down near the bottom. And you just wait for it to jump. When it comes across from you, you can start lowering the rod and get a little bit more free drift as it goes below. And then watch it when it swings up because it's a very enticing move. It just lifts up through the water column in front of a fish's nose and that will quite often trigger a strike. Fishing a nymph is the same as fishing a dry fly. You don't scatter cast. You don't just hit it out anywhere. You pick particular runs, you pick particular areas, and you work them. There's a good little rock right there. There's a nice little slot of deep water that comes right down along the side of it. I can plan the drift of my nymph so that it dead drifts right down through it and then comes down below it and all that way it's working red hot holding water for trout. You can work a little bit better behind it, take it and just slack line it across into it, mend it, get that line up. Again, watch drag, watch drag. You know that fly is down there. You know that indicator could jump any moment. It takes a lot of concentration but it's definitely worth the effort. Ooh! All right. All right. <laughs> oh, he did take it deep. Come on. Oh, wait a minute. I think it's a nice one. All right. All right. All right. Oh. Oh. I have a feeling you better have a net. Oh, he's strong. He's tough for he's tough for his size. Right. He's a nice. He's a gorgeous fish. Oh, he's pretty. Now that we've talked about dry fly fishing, let's move on and talk about nymph fishing. Fish will eat about 80% of the time underneath the surface of the water. Therefore, nymph fishing will be a very effective way to fish. The only problem with nymph fishing is you can't always see the fish eat your fly. That's why we use a strike indicator. A strike indicator will act kind of like a bobber. Um, you're going to be watching that on top. When you see that thing dart, move, it means the fish is eating your nymph. 
Now, it, it's not always a big, it's not always a big dart underneath the surface like a bobber is. Sometimes it's, it's a very subtle take. Your 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 indicator will just kind of, it'll just move just a little bit. That means the fish is taking your fly. Another way to nymph fish without watching the indicator is to watch the actual fish you're fishing for. If you're fishing for one big fish, you can watch him. If he moves out and he opens his mouth and you see that big white mouth open, you know he's probably taking your fly. You can set the hook. You don't need to always watch that indicator. That's why it's a very effective way to fish. We're standing out here in the middle of a river. We got a nice hatch going on. That means dry flies on top of the water. What some people don't realize is you can nymph fish during the middle of a dry fly hatch like this. We've now attached our uh, Cabela's nymph leader. On the nymph leader you can see it has a little indicator right here. This is what we're going to be able to watch to see if that fish takes our nymph underneath the surface. Big thing with nymph fishing also is figuring out the depth of the fish. That's the reason we have this indicator on. If the fish is right underneath the surface, you can make this indicator very, very short. You don't have to have it deep at all. If you can see the fish way underneath the water feeding, you're gonna have to move this baby way on up so you have a lot of, a lot of depth to get down there. When you're fishing a nymph, the one thing that we have to understand is that the nymph moves with the current, okay? Nymphs don't always have leaders attached to them, so they're gonna be moving naturally with the water. That's why we gotta get a nice long dead drift. And a dead drift just means throwing your fly here, and then you get drift right along with the current, naturally downstream. If it's not, if it's not going naturally downstream like a normal bug will, they're not going to eat it. They're going to eat all the naturals around it except for your fly. That's why we got to really concentrate on getting that nice long dead drift. Now the nymph, oop, he looked at it. Oh, he took it. He took it. Don't waste your time on him with that fly. He, he had it in his mouth and spit it out. Yeah, you know, you can't be married to that fly going down, as we tell people. Uh, he just, uh, without being able to see him, I should have told you to strike. There are a few who enjoy the game of figuring out what to fish with and when, as much as Jack Dennis and Kelly Gallup. This pair of avid anglers, tires, and fly fishing authors can spend more time talking about what to fish than actually fishing. Jack and Kelly have spent so much time contemplating trout and their habits that their fly selection can come down to more than the species. They're looking for the form of the fly and which of those forms is being fed upon by the trout most readily. Let's try him again. He'd be a fun fish. He isn't a very big fish, but, but, but it's a fun fish. All right. He has no absolute interest in either one of those flies. But I'm not sure, I'm, I'm not sure that he, we want to even mess with him. There he goes. He's looking at it. He took it. Oh, wow. Boy, you burned that last one. He left his rock. <laughs> Kelly, what fly are you putting on right now? I'm going to go back and try one of those uh, 20 cripples with the, uh, the curved body fly. Right, the gallop crickle. Crickle, 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 crickle. Let's see if we just can't get one down in the film. He seems to be splitting his time between nymphing and dries. Yeah, we got a boy came back down here and said, I got pushed out of the pack. Good sign. It must mean they're actually feeding. When they're actually feeding, they'll push out, they'll push out these fish until everybody will take his own little spot. There he goes. Yes, sir, Bobo. My man from Michigan comes through, and he's a biggie. He is a fat boy. All right, he's a netter. Way to go there, Kelly. Boy, it's just unbelievable the size of fish in here. <laughs> Not too shabby a place in Wyoming. <clears throat> What's amazing is all those fish are pushing down below us. There's a lot of spring creeks in the west that have these 16 to 18 inch fish, and that's sometimes all you, the, the largest fish you're gonna see. All right. He's getting tired. Trying to go over into those weeds. Yeah. Turn his head over here. Nice brown color in him, isn't he? Yeah. Almost looks like a brown. He's down Bring here. Bring his head down to you. Just a oh, second, a just a second. Oh. Hey, nice look at that. Good shot. Oh man, that's a that's a heavy fish. That's a three, four pound fish. A gelatinous fatty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I 
promise you a 23 inch fish. You weren't lying. Yeah. I'm gonna have to, he's got that sunk spinner just sucked down in there. Yeah, maybe we ought to just give it to him. Another one these snagged. fish get caught so much here, he'll be he'll have that fly gone in just a little while. Yeah. You know, that's another thing too with nymphs, you can get them down there deep, and I watch people just, and they're just trying to dig yeah. out it. You yeah, know, a dollar fifty nymph, when that, that fish is worth more than a dollar fifty, just break that six X, tip it right. off, and let him go. He's got my line. There you go. There he goes. Isn't that something? It's top. <laughs> The most important thing to remember when streamer fishing is to make the fly act like a minnow. It must swim. It must move. A streamer that just lays dead drifts in the water like that is not effective. We're going to want to swim them downstream, across the current. We're looking for big structure out there, logs or submerged rocks. And we're working the streamer very carefully, giving it little bumps. There's a method called the Montana pump, where you cast out, strip, pump with your rod tip. strip pump with your rod tip. Strimp, pump with your rod tip. Each time you do that, you're bringing in line and moving the streamer in short jerks. One of the problems with streamer fishing is that you get a lot of what we call short strikes. The fish come up and bump it. And to eliminate that, you want to have tension. Be able to set that strike. You know, I really enjoy streamer fishing because you very seldom catch any real small fish. And you know you might even catch a trophy of a lifetime. There's some basic rules that you need to remember. You must make the streamer swim. And you must keep a tight line. Keen eyes. I like to fish my streamers close to the surface and move them and watch for that fish to come out of the deep and take the streamer. That's the excitement of streamer fishing. Now that would be that would be a really great fish on a one fly. That would be a nice twenty inch fish. That'd go probably three, three and a half. That would be a great fish for the Jackson Hole one fly on the snake. That could be a, you know that's a that's Beautiful. a great snake river cutthroat. Beautiful. That's a nice fish. That is not a big yeah, fish man. for this river. Yeah, I'm sure it isn't. He just slammed it, and I wasn't on top of him. And then he came back around. Oh, and Darren lets you get him. Yeah, good fish. Well, he wanted to slam it at first and just wound it and then come back and take it. There it is. There he goes. All right, buddy. Scott Sanchez, double bunny. You betcha. Fish. Boy, you got to love those eyes. Knock yeah, well, he ate one of the eyes. <laughs> well, buddy. <laughs> That's kind of One fun. for the Wyoming team. <laughs> well, well, Michigan will come back. <laughs> uh, you guys in Michigan are pretty tough about yeah. doing that wet waiting. Let's do of that follow-up. Now, Kelly on retrieves. I like to start out moving it real fast and then experiment from that. If I, if I don't get fish taking it, then I start, you know, experimenting. I'm pretty much the same way, Jack. I like to start really fast, you know, with a, what I call a jerk strip retrieve. That's a, the rod is manipulating the fly, animating the fly a lot. And then if it, if, you know, you don't get a strike in the first few minutes, then, uh, you can slow it down or longer pauses, you know, things like that. But I just, I really enjoy knowing that what I'm doing is bringing the fish or triggering the fish to respond. Right. So I really get a charge out of, you know, knowing that the rod manipulation or whatever I'm doing to the fly is what created the strike. Big browns are the, they're the top of the food chain in the river system, you know, and so they, 
they're feeding. It's a, you know, it's a predation thing. They're just out munching whatever comes in their territory. Kind of, you know, we were talking about grizzly bears earlier. Same thing. They're they're the they're the grizzly bears of the river. I don't think a lot of times they're even eating it for food. I think when we get those swats, you know, when they come up and just kind of uh -huh. hit it, I think a lot of times that's kind of like uh, just a warning. Just kind of like get out of my neighborhood. You're in my neighborhood. You don't belong here. Yep, and so they come up and give it a smash, and that's all you're going to get out of it. And, but the beauty of fishing a streamer is, I mean, the size of the fish, even if you don't hook up, it's a fish you'll never have seen on a dry fly. You know, exactly. The size of that fish that just munched us back there. You gotta have the green dray catch or stone flies or something. Right. Other than that, then your your best chances are with the screamer. They're aggressive fish. Meat eaters. But it's an art, something you have to practice all the time. Well, that's a beautiful little spot right there, Darren. Big honking fish. <laughs> Just had a near fatal loop in the back of the reel. I'll get it. Darren, go ahead. Good call, Darren. Black Willie. Coming at me. Coming at you, Darren. Could have picked a better place to hook that thing, you know. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Six pound fish, it looks like. <laughs> Here, shoot that one again. <laughs> All right. The big black woolly. So, oh. <laughs> stoned on me here. Stonewall. Stonewally. Fantastic. Stuck on that woolly bugger on me when I wasn't looking. The black woolly scope. Conehead. Oh, yeah, that's easy six pounds. All right, well, you pulled that out. It was just around the corners where we end. I'll take it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we don't have a lot of water left, so that was good work, Kelly. Yeah, it was. Uh, well, you made the call, a... buddy. You're the one that said put on the black. Well, I tried the black uh, yuck bug, and it did nothing. Look at that. That's a good fish. There it goes, right, right down the... As soon as that trout comes up and eat it, it's a very subtle take. It's not a jerk. You don't want to rip it up. This is what happens with a lot of people. They had the bass set. Boom! They rip it up. That fly's going to come out of that fish's mouth so fast you're not going to know what happened. You want to have a nice subtle, just boop, straight up. I've got the fish on right now. You can see he's taking a little bit of line out. I, have, I still have my trigger finger right here. This is how I'm going to control it. As you can see, he's still taking out line. So use your palm. You can also use the palm of your other hand to kind of stop the run so he doesn't take out too much line. Just like that. Now, when he gets done running, whew, that's a good fish. Now he's done running. Oh, still not done. Okay, now what you want to do is you want to reel it up. Always keeping tension. Always keep tension on this fish. Very important here that the fish runs right at you. You got to make sure you have your trigger finger on your line here so you can strip it in while he's coming at you. Because your line, you're going to have slack out there. You got to get that in if he's coming at you to keep tension on that fish. Then if he decides to make another run against from you, you got to give it a little bit. Give it a little bit. See all that slack line down there? It's got to get out there. That's, whoo, there he goes. It's a good fish. You got to get the tension on the fish, okay? You got to get him to do what he does not want to do. That's what's going to tire him out. If he's coming right at you, get that rod tip straight up. Get that rod tip up. If he wants to dive straight down, get him back up, okay? There's a fine line between the pressure of the fish and how much pressure you want to put on the fish, okay? You can't put too much pressure on him, especially if you're on a light tippet. If you put too much pressure on him, boom, it's going to pop. Okay, if you don't have enough pressure, he's going to spit that darn hook right out of his mouth. So there's a fine line in there. Once you figure out that, the pressure points, the amount of pressure to put on the fish, you're going to be hooking, you're going to be landing your fish all day long.
Looking for some action? Cortland has the right fly line for you. Cortland produces high quality fly lines so that you get the maximum performance and enjoyment out of every cast and every fish. Try Cortland's new 444 Clear Camo or the stiff long distance 444 SL Clear and Clear Tip Fly Lines. These superior intermediate lines are perfect for stealthy fishing in still or fast moving water. See a Cortland Pro Shop for our complete line of quality fly fishing products. We're coming up on a nice, beautiful little Spring Creek hole. And we don't want to keep a high profile and we don't want to wade in the water. So a lot of times we'll crawl up to the pool. But it's kind of hard to cast this way. You'll find yourself getting tangled, maybe even catching something behind you. By bringing this leg up, having your knee up, the other knee down, you can find yourself a very comfortable way of casting. Having your hand here will help keep the line better under control. Now also watch, you know, you want a short stroke, you want to watch your back cast. If you start breaking your wrist, you're going to find you're going to be back in the weeds just like that. So it's important that you keep your short casting stroke. And I'll tell you, this position, it's really hard for you to dip the rod back too far. It's really a good way of casting. So we're going to lay our cast out. Now you're going to find that uh, other casts could help you. By lowering your cast down, keeping the same short stroke integrity of the stroke, you can lay a cast up underneath the bank. I happen to see a fish that rose underneath that bank. Again, if you're casting across the stream and you want to get it in under a branch, this really works well. You can move your cast anyway, up high, down low, any direction as long as you keep the stroke and the timing, letting the line straighten out, come forward, do not break that wrist, and let the cast go out. Now, another effective way is to do what we talked about before, which is shooting the line. All right, again, see, down here we can't hold a lot of line up, so it really is important to learn how to shoot the line. Here we go again. Pull down on it and shoot it. Yes. Boy, now you can see the effectiveness of learning to shoot the line and even that little pull. Again, watch how the line drifts. And here and again, you can end more little drifts. I'll tell you, you get very conscious when you're up on a bank like this, especially looking down at fish, of what your line will do. And the more that you can direct the line with the rod tip to where you want it to go, the more you're going to be more successful. Real problem is to try to mend like this when you're in this kind of clear, calm water. Now let's go on to some other casts that I know will help you in your fishing. Here we are in a fishing situation, small spring creek. I put on a little nymph. I've got some fluorescent green yarn as a strike indicator, and I'm prepared to tackle some fish. But I've practiced out on the lawn. You know, we, we worked on some of those problems that we talked about, and I, and I hope you've done the same thing. Now let's put them to work. You know, some of the things that have been bothering you, let's, let's see if we can correct them so you can have a better fishing situation. First of all, one of the big problems is not having your stroke down. What happens, it's like anything, they call it buck fever and hunting. You see a fish and you start casting, and all of a sudden, here goes the rest because you're nervous, you see a fish rising, and you're afraid, that, oh, I'm gonna hit the water. And, and it's, it's almost like a nervous twit you have. You don't know what to do, you just, you're so afraid when to let it go. Oh, maybe I got too much line, and finally, after about 20 casts, you, you let it go, and, and the cast isn't where you wanted it to go in the first place. And the fish took off. That false casting can get you in trouble. What we don't want you to do is get that false cast for a nervous or either reaction or to add line. Now, what I mean by adding line, see, I'm letting some line go right here. And the line increases, and all of a sudden, the tip of the line starts hitting the water. So you start increasing the speed, and all of a sudden, here comes the line, and bam, it hits your rod, and there you go. You got a bird's nest. And of course, the fish are still rising. How do you correct that? Just like we talked about out on the lawn, it's the stroke. 
short stroke. Watch that you don't rotate that arm. Rotating the wrist separates the arm from the rod. But look at the loop. Look how wide the loops are. Look how tight the loops become. Let's start false casting like I told you not to do and see what happens. So as you start to correct your problem with your wrist, you're short stroking it and you have so much line that you're slowing down and the line speed slow down and you're starting to hit the water. Well, already you spooked the fish. So you increase the speed. You say, oh, wait a minute. Dennis told me to open up my stroke, which I'm doing, and all of a sudden you're getting the line out. Hey, everything's working except all of a sudden, boom, your arm collapses. You're worn out. You've done 50 casts. When, you know, this rod is an amazing tool. Now, see all that line that we have out? Now, I want you to watch something. What we can do is we're going to get this as one simple roll cast. One, two, back, cast. I've just come upon a nice part of the Green River here. I'm getting ready to walk upstream and fish it. The best part's probably right by those rocks. But I do not know what's laying right in here. In fact, a lot of the big fish will move around, especially in the afternoon, and feed at the tails of these pools. So you must have a game plan before you start off fishing. You don't run right up there and start fishing the best part. So what we're going to do is work our way up. What we do is fish the water closest to us first, right along the rocks. This shallow part where there may not be a fish, but you never know. That may be where Gold Grandpa's laying. I'll move a little farther up and just work my way methodically up the stream, fishing inside first and gradually out. But most important, I'm looking for the sign of the trout that rise, the swirl, a tail, a flash, anything that might indicate that there's a trout there. Remember, have a game plan. Many times when you're streamer or nymph fishing, when you're going down deep, you're going to hook a log or a rock or a clump of weeds. And you may not want to wade out there. In fact, you may not want to go swimming after it. So let me just show you a little trick that'll work some of the time, maybe not all of the time. Take your rod, make a little roll cast, and flip up like that. And that'll save you a deep wade and a pair of very wet waders. Fishing into the wind, you, hey, if you make a normal cast, this is what's going to happen. Oh, boy. You don't want that to happen. What you want to do is to drive that line into the wind. And the way we accomplish it is lower our power stroke. In other words, instead of applying our power right here, we, we apply the power straight in with driving that tip into the wind, like this. Sure, as we said before, the line's going to hit hard, but you're going to get a cast out. And if you don't get your cast out, you're not going to catch any fish anyway. It works well with streamers and nymphs especially. Again, fire that tip into the air. If you apply it up here and fire it, it's still not going to make any difference. It's still going to come back at you. What you've got to do is lower your power stroke, tightening your loop. Watch the loop. Loop is tighter. Less wind resistance, tighter, and into the wind. This will make your fishing much more successful, and you won't have to pack your rod up and head back in on a windy day. You can use the wind to your advantage by having it behind you especially in places like lakes and big rivers, where you have hoppers and terrestrials and other things that fall into the water. Also big caddis. You can hold your rod high in the air and let the wind move your fly across the water, skipping it and jumping it. Just use your rod tip to move the fly around. And boy, I'll tell you, a crash from a big brown will really make it exciting. Use the wind to your advantage, and you'll improve your fly fishing. When you have structure behind you, you must learn how to roll cast. Bring the line up till it comes right by your shoulder, a quick flip of the wrist. A steeple cast can also work. 
Again, flip the line straight up in the air and... Why should a beginner come to the Henry's Fork River? It's got a reputation of being an expert's river. Big fish, small flies, tough fishing. Is that true? Yeah, you bet it's true. But I think that it's a good place for a beginner to come as well. This is one of the most prolific rivers in the world as far as production of fish. There are lots of fish in here of all sizes. And I think a beginner can really have a lot of chances at different sizes of fish, fishing dry flies. And you can learn the same techniques that it takes to catch a large fish. What about watching good fishermen fish to fish? Can't you learn a lot from that? Yeah, I think you can by watching other people, but you can learn a lot more just experiencing it yourself. You can get tips from seeing how other people approach fish and how they cast, but what you want to do is to have a lot of chances to catch fish and here you can do that because there's so many fish in this river and then if you can be a little more accomplished you're ready to take on the bigger fish they don't get big by accident and that's <laughs> why uh, you know it you have to do everything right to catch these big fish but these smaller fish they make a lot of mistakes and anybody can catch them okay Mike we've got a fish rising over there and we're working to him we talked about not throwing the line over the top of them. Mm -hmm. Well, I try to not cast over the fish. I like to cast a little short, and I don't even like to false cast over the fish. A lot of times you'll see anglers doing this, false cast right over the fish and then cast right on the fish. Well, they slap the water as they're casting. When I even false cast, I'll false cast a little bit to the side mm -hmm. and then bring the fly over. Right then bring the cast in and I throw slack on the water. That's what is a hard thing to learn to do. Right. It's going to take some practice. If you cast the line straight down well, it's like good. this, then it's going to start dragging. Mm -hmm. See the line goes right. down ahead and pulls it. So you want to learn to throw some slack line on the water so that it won't drag the fly. And There's a lot of different casts to do that. You can see the slack here. Now everything's going down at the same speed. Mm -hmm. A lot of beginners pile their cast up. They get impatient. They get excited. Do you have any tips? Well, I think that it's hard to not get excited and you're going to make mistakes. The biggest tip I'd have is to learn to practice aside from the days that you're fishing. I think you need to be out on your lawn practicing casting, I think about 30 hours. Before, before, you, can before really you hit here? Well, it's sure a lot better because then you can be a little more confident in making these casts. Now you're decelerating your cast so it lands softly. Show us how you accomplish that. Well, see, you can do it a lot of ways, but what you're trying to do is back in the power back off from the line. See, I'll do that again. You make the cast, but then I'm backing the rod up just before the fly hits the water. You can call that a bounce cast is, is a term that Mel Krieger uses for it. Any tips about finding your fly out there? I know a lot of beginners have trouble spotting a dry fly, and that's what they usually start fishing with is a dry fly. Well, I don't think it has really that much to do with beginners. I think that at least for myself, the flies get smaller the older you get. Now yeah, that happens. They get hard to see. <laughs> so That's what glasses are for. What you want to do is is try to if you lose the fly, 
still keep fishing it out. And it, if you don't see the fly dragging or something unnatural, then chances are the fly is floating correctly. And if a fish rises in the vicinity of where you think the fly is, then strike. And that brings me to another mistake that I see a lot of people make, and that's they strike too hard. Mm -hmm. The little tiny fly, you don't have to rip back like this. Looks more impressive, though. Well, it may. It, we like it in the shop because we sell a lot more flies. Well, that's Because you true. leave a lot of them in the fish. But all you need to do to strike a fish is just tighten up, just like that. Just a little tightness, and that fly will set. Also, popping the fly. How many people, when they lift the fly off the water, pop? How do you eliminate that? Well, I think you, you need to learn to let the water help load your rod when you're making a, your back cast. If you jerk it off the water, you're going to scare fish, you're going to get tangles, and you may lose your fly. You may pop it off. So what to do is just start to get a little tension on it. Now the, and lift it off the water. That's right. And the water now is going to pull on the line a little bit, start to load your rod, and then you can just softly pick it up. A fish is going to be rising out there. How far away from that fish that you're working on do you want to let the fly drift before you pop it up? Well, you want to get it well below the fish, where you think the fish is. Uh, these fish will cruise around a lot and they'll drift forward and back and so I'd wait until it's well below the fish before you pick it back up and cast again. When you've been learning to cast, you're learning to stop on the forward cast and the back cast. But on that last cast, follow the line down with your rod like this. Just follow it down there. If you stop and leave it stopped, then your line's just going to flip Look, right back. That's what it does. And that happens to people. You tie knots in there, wind knots. Yep, and then you can end up with a lash up. And you'll get great experience at untangling knots. Now Mike is checking to make sure there isn't any wind knots in that leader. Because he knows that any time on the Henry's fork, he might hit that trophy lifetime. You can just run your fingers over it and feel it. One of the ways to progress past just learning to cast and fishing for a smaller fish is going out with the professional fly fishing guide. Mike, you operate a guide service. What do your guides teach the clients? Well, I think there's no better way to learn than actually being on the stream and doing everything rather than learning to cast out on a lawn. Catching fish in a river is the way to learn, and the guides can certainly help you do that. We both operated fly fishing schools and we've seen the practical part.
to have these places that we can enjoy ourselves and, and feel the way. performance and enjoyment out of every cast and every fish. Try Cortland's new 444 Clear Camo or the stiff long distance 444 SL Clear and Clear Tip Fly Lines. These superior intermediate lines are perfect for stealthy fishing in still or fast moving water. See a Cortland Pro Shop for our complete line of quality fly fishing products. <laughs>